So this is a workshop to obviously learn about data joint, right? And I hope that you're coming with uh, some idea of what data joint is, but perhaps mostly just to learn exactly what data joint would be about. Now, just to go too much off, my name is Edgar Walker. I'm a graduate student in the Andreas Tolles lab in the Department of Neuroscience in Baylor College of Medicine. But I'm also one of the core developers for data joint. So it's actually quite exciting for me to share this uh, product that we had over, was well, started with Dimitri, who would give a talk about, you know, who introduced you to what data joint is. And I joined in the middle, and obviously we've been developing this as part of something we will use. And I mean, we, we obviously love it, uh, we think it's great. It helps us a lot in doing our own research. So it's really exciting to see that there are this many people here interested, you know, interested enough to come this early in the morning to learn about it. So today uh, we'll go through, a, try to make it as interactive as possible. Hopefully you learn a lot. And also I've tried to make it as casual as possible. So if you have any questions or concerns in the middle, be sure to raise your hand and just, or shout it out loud, so, okay? Like we don't wanna make, leave everyone, anyone behind. Okay, so that's enough about myself and my excitement. So at this point, I'd like to introduce the creator of the data joint who made this all, who started all of this, Dmitry Yatsenko, and he'll introduce you to what data joint is, what data pipeline is all about. Good morning. All right, let's jump right into it. <clears throat> so um, first I will uh, kind of summarize who we are. So again, uh, we, we are both uh, working neuroscientists. So for us, having a, a good tools is very important. Data science is not our primary subject of interest in our research, but without it, we cannot work. So, uh, so we're primarily targeting working, uh, working scientists. Neuroscience has been our focus, but there is nothing specific to neuroscience in data joint. So what is the problem? Let's start with a little bit of philosophy, just kind of basic philosophy of science. So uh, science works um, in this, very roughly in this cycle. So um, on the bottom you go, this is the, the classic, this is what you learn in, uh, in an introductory science class. That you start with a hypothesis that you just intuit from your experience observing different phenomena. You make predictions, you design a test to, to uh, an experiment to test that prediction um, and the experiment produces data. What sometimes is less emphasized and uh, less in formally exercised is the rest of the loop. Then by, by looking at the data, you look at the surprising phenomena that, that you cannot yet explain, and, uh, and then the loop completes. And so as data, it, classically, it, we have relied on our senses and our, on our reason to, to complete this loop. So we relied on our reason to go from hypotheses to predictions and from uh, in the entire loop. But, uh, and we used our senses for observation. But as data become more complex, we need formal tools for, for both deductive approach, the bottom approach, and the inductive approach. And so the, the formal tools for, for de the deductive approach for testing hypotheses is statistics, classical statistics. And scientists in the natural sciences are expected to know and be well versed in statistics. But the other, uh, the formal tools to go from data to phenomena, to, to deal with the vast amounts of data to detect regularities in the data, that is a lot less represented in the natural sciences and in the sciences in general. There's a lot less formal training. So that field is called data science. Data science is basically a collection of disciplines that deal with how to deal with massive data and infer regularities in phenomena in that data. And uh, it's a lot less developed than statistics. A lot less known and a lot less enforced. A lot of scientists who come into the field, they have not been exposed. They know how to work with Excel. So currently, data science is very quickly evolving because it's a, it's a collection, it's whatever is currently available. And so currently by, by data science, most people mean um, a collection of the following things. Um, you need to understand databases, so dealing with large, effectively dealing with large banks of data. Uh, machine learning, which is basically statistical techniques for inferring regularities uh, from data. Big data, 
is basically, big data is vaguely defined as anything that cannot be handled by traditional approach. Something that does not fit in your RAM, something that is very difficult to deal with a, with a traditional database. And uh, cloud computing now and visualization are, are, are parts of uh, data science. So we will focus on what data joint is, it's, it's kind of the, in, more in the, in the first part, databases, how to work with large amounts of data and um, structure in the data. So one, one dimension um, of the problem and one reason for, for having disciplined uh, uh, data science approach is that science becomes, became very data rich, is growing very data rich. And even if you are driven by a single question and you design a study for an experiment, you answer one question, you generate a lot of data that can be used to, to answer a lot of different questions. So for example, in this paper uh, from our lab, um, the basic question was, we found that there are correlates between the dilation of the pupil and the state of the brain, how information was processed. And uh, to answer that question, to research that question, we had to collect a lot of different modalities of data, electrophysiology to photon imaging, uh, behavior, um, you know, whole cell and uh, recordings, um, whisking, running. Um, so all of this was combined. Do you think there's more in that data beyond just the question that we answered? You can probably reanalyze the data for many different other questions. So this, this data richness should not be lost. Even if you answer, answer the question that you originally intended, you should, you should be able to answer question, other questions with the same data. Another um, dimension is data-centric projects. So not just data-rich, but data-centric. A data-centric project, well, the way we'll define it here, one example is microns. Our lab is participating in this project. So we per, we're performing uh, measurements, massive measurements of neuronal population activity using two-photon imaging um, and combining that with, um, with studies of um, connectomics using electron microscopy. So data -centric, a data-centric project is one where the data is a principal output of the project, not just confirming or testing a hypothesis, but data is what is delivered at the end of the project to the broader scientific community um, and uh, so for other scientists to, to use the data to test their questions. So um, um, there, and these data-centric projects are proliferating. There are many different uh, data-centric pro uh, projects. So some examples are very specifically data-centric projects in neuroscience are, for example, the Allen Institute, whose goal is to just catalog and, and map a lot of different uh, dimensions of, of brain architecture and, and function. Um, project, one project that we're participating or uh, we're helping with data join is uh, the International Brain Laboratory. It's 21 labs working together, leading labs in the world. Uh, to answering the same question or centered around the same question. So how, and one of the principal outputs is to make the data available at the end of the project for other labs to use. The Mesoscale Activity Project, it's um, a joint project uh, funded by the Simons Foundation between a lab at Baylor College of Medicine, NYU, and Genelia Farms. Um, and, and so as well, one of their critical requirements is to, to present data, to deliver data to the scientific community. Uh, IRPA microns is the project that I mentioned in the previous slide. One of its principles, even though it focuses on a lot of questions, one, it's a data-centric project. It delivers data to others. And then the NIH is recently um, is sponsoring a lot of uh, programs, uh, such as the U19 programs, that where the requirement is also to deliver data. And uh, we are, data joint is already being used by several of these projects, microns, um, the International Brain Lab, my, uh, the Mesoscale Activity Project, and uh, two of the U19 projects as well are, are using or planning to use data joint as their principal data organization tool. So what problem 
are we trying to solve in the lab? This is how a typical lab now is organized. You start a project with an experiment design. You think of a, you think of a hypothesis, you design the experiment, and you spend some time collecting data. Usually, students are fairly segregated, and they're collecting their data by, them, by themselves. They, you know, they learn from each other, but they run their project, and they're responsible for organizing their data, for running their analysis, and then they work toward publication. So there are a couple of problems with this approach. You, you may know about the, uh, the uh, reproducibility crisis. So if you collect tons of data and you finally find something, um, the data that did not produce the result is not ever, you know, doesn't ever show up. And so there's kind of a selection process in what data gets, what results get published. Only the, the results that produced a significant result. And so there is a reproducibility uh, uh, crisis if you, if you take a lot of the studies in neuroscience and try to reproduce them from scratch, not by reanalyzing the data that was published, but by running the entire experiment, sometimes the finding does not reproduce. So the NIH is aware of that, and they are producing a lot of guidelines on how to use data, how, how to incorporate good data science uh, practices. And for the most part, they focus on, on the part that is right before publishing. So they're requiring this, increasingly requiring to publish data. And there is a principle called the FAIR principle for data. So the data must be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable so that it can be used for meta-analysis, meta automated analysis by machine learning. And so what happens in the lab that was running the old process and now they're required to repackage the data before publishing. They really don't want to do it. They do it at the very end. Again, they only publish the data that was used for the study, not all the data that they collected necessarily. So the NIH understands this problem, but right now most of the tools are still focusing on, on this final pre-publication repackaging. So the alternative approach, and this is what DataJoint is about, is what we'll call just building a data, pi uh, data pipeline in the lab as a separate activity that, uh, around which the entire lab is organized from multiple labs. And so the priorities are a little bit shifted. You, you need to invest some time in the beginning to plan and, or, and organize the lab around it. But if your lab is already organized around it, 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 works, it works well. So the rest is, is very similar. Um, so multiple people can interact with the same pipeline, share the data from the beginning. So the, the difference from the traditional approach or the more common approach is the data is organized immediately to be shareable, to be well-structured, and uh, uh, pretty much ready for any type of query or, or even uh, integrating, uh, integrating tools for publishing, for sharing. And then once you establish this process, then additional studies can run on the same pipeline. And so the overhead with the second and third project, you, once you overcome that initial restructuring of your lab, the overhead uh, drops and you basically work much more efficiently with, uh, with massive data. So th this is what we, I would call the data-centric approach versus the test-centric approach where data is not considered to be important at the end. And uh, one thing that this allows to do is to separate, kind of do have some labor separation. So the data pipeline becomes the backbone of the lab in terms of data. And so other people, like the IT or web, web if you need to add a web uh, interface, then um, you can hire somebody and they, can, they know how to work with the data pipeline. You don't need to collect the data from each individual researcher. You can work directly with the pipeline. So that's the, the solution to the problem. A solution to the problem that we propose is a, a framework for building uh, data pipelines in the science lab. Key principles are organize early and always, um, build teams around the data pipeline, and uh, have a very principled data model. And this is what a lot of this workshop is about, how to, how to do it in a principled way. And division of labor so that you as a neuroscientist, as a, as a, you are not focused on the IT questions or cloud computing. That's taken care of 
by, by teams who know how to work with your data pipeline, so how to work with the technology. So you can focus on the data. So what data joint? So again, it's a free open source framework for building and operating data pipelines. It uses uh, an enhanced relational data model, and we'll talk a, a bit about it. Um, it. It can use a variety of architectures, but that's in the background. So you work with the data through Python, and you can work with terabytes of data. What happens in the background and you work with, with it the same way, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on, on your laptop. So, so there is a lot more consistency in how you interact with the data. And um, it can be in the cloud, it can be on your laptop, or on a server in your lab. And finally, there is a community. So one disclaimer that I, 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 should, I should mention. So since, since data joints started spreading to other labs, we, we started a company to help labs who need to adopt it. So, um, so part of the, so it's called Vades, the company is called Vades, and um, so any lab that can, that needs support, um, everything is, you know, the framework is free, people can adopt and set it up, but some, some labs need help, uh, we, we can help that. So uh, one question, if you were asked, if most people, if they're asked, okay, build a data pipeline, they will think of it as a data repository, basically a common place to put files and they will think of some way to organize them, usually by naming conventions or folders. This is what we see in most, in most labs that approach this. And this is uh, a simple data repository, just does a couple of basic functions. You can put things there and take them out the same way, and you may have some way to control access, who has access to what. And this is what NIH, uh, the NIH sponsors a lot of these repositories for shared data, uh, and this is where a lot of basically thinking, this is what people mostly think about data sharing. A database has, a, it's also a data repository, but it has additional functions. It allows to structure the data so that data integrity is observed. Dependencies between data, identifiability. It, uh, so it maintains and enforces the integrity. It also allows um, complex queries. So a data repository is you put something, you take something out in the same form. A data query is uh, you, can, you can ask the database to give you uh, derived data from what you put in. So your summary data or a different projection of the data, and we'll see a lot of that through the workshop. <laughs> Finally, the data pipeline is also a repository. It has all the features of a database, but it all has additional features. It allows, um, it enforces the workflow and communicates the workflow and uh, integrates computation into the pipeline. So it has a consistent way to perform computations. So data joint pipeline looks like um, uh, a graph of nodes. So basically each node contains data and uh, optionally computation. So you design, when you design your experiment or a data pipeline for your experiment, you define these nodes and then the initial nodes are used for entering data during the experiment. This is pretty much like your lab book. And uh, underneath are really um, tables that look very much like spreadsheets that you can fill out. Um, and then the rest of the pipeline continues and the next nodes can, can contain computations. So this is an example of a two photon experiment. So it starts with a mouse information session, two photon session, a scan. Um, and then computation takes over. So the next nodes may perform uh, motion alignment, motion correction, segmentation um, of the images, um, extraction of calcium traces, and for example, computation of receptive fields. So let's talk about data models. Data, uh, data models, um, one second. Um, data models are, um, the way you think as a human, you think about the data. So this is basically a collection of uh, concept principles for defining and working with data. So if, if, you, like, if you ask yourself now, how do you what, what is data made of? Um, how do you think, what kind of operations? So when you work with data in, in, um, in your experiments or in uh, your analysis, how do you think of it? A lot of people um, are familiar with, or most people think of files and folders. And then within files, you may have some structure. So this is basically your, your data model. It, it, it has to do with more with kind of your, 
your mental toolbox, how you think of data. Um, there are a couple of data models that are, most people are familiar with. One is the object model. So if you program, you work with the object model. Uh, in a language like MATLAB or Python, basically uh, data consists of objects, variables that have different properties. Um, and you can use the dot notation to look at the properties and each property could be another object. And so it's, it's a little bit of a nested model. So this is one way to think about data. It's not very commonly used for data storage. It's mostly used for programming. Another uh, very popular data model is called the hierarchical model. Um, and uh, this is pretty much like your file system. So you open a node and then the, each node has additional nodes and you open them up and that's basically how most people think of stored data. This is the most familiar uh, model to most people. And, and some files within the files, a lot of files are also hierarchical data structures. So for example, the HDF5, that stands for hierarchical data format, .mat files if you work in MATLAB, XML, YAML, JSON, Bison, all these uh, files have um, hierarchical data structure. So a lot of people think, kind of stay in that framework for data storage. This is probably the most common way to store data. Another data model is called um, the relational model. So it started by Ted Codd in, at IBM in 69. It really came to dominate for 40 years, 50 years, the world of databases. So it starts with, it only has, it's kind of a very abstract mathematical model, has five basic principles that all data are represented in the form of flat tables. Uh, flat meaning they're not nested. You cannot have a table within a cell of a table. It has things like domain constraints, basically each column, each attribute must belong to a specific domain or data type. Um, has uniqueness constraints, so basically one column could, could have unique constraints, um, basically be unique across the table, and that's enforced. You can have referential constraints, meaning that one table cannot have an entry unless there is a matching entry in another table. And uh, it has declarative queries. So you, when you query data, in most other data models, you have to write a program that step by step will, will iterate, have a for loop, or have multiple steps to get to the data. In the relational model, you, you form a data query as an expression that tells what to get, but not individual steps. So this is what you will see in data join. So the problem with the relational data model, that by itself it's very abstract and not conceptually, conceptually refined. Even though it's the, the dominant way to organize structured data, most scientists don't use it. For some reason, it didn't make the crossover into, the, into scientific computing very much. So people stay kind of in the, in the hierarchical like file system. The relational data model is arguably is the most flexible and the most rigorous way to represent complex structured data that enforces constraints, that enforces consistency. So by itself, it's very abstract, and it was kind of more academic. Um, but then you know, the SQL became, um, is the most the dominant implementation of the relational data model. It's very unusual in computer science that a solid computational concept is, only, is dominated by a single language, by a single implementation, uh, multiple implementations of the same language. But um, there, are, there are other implementations of the same model. So uh, in 1976, there was a big breakthrough in terms of refining conceptually how to define, um, how to translate real world constraints, real world problems into relational designs. It's called the, uh, the entity relationship model. And uh, it was a conceptual clarification. It come, came with very uh, helpful diagramming notation. And most people only know it as a diagramming notation today. It didn't, it didn't translate into its own programming language, unfortunately. So data joint is further conceptual refinement. It's very much inspired by the entity relationship model, but it's a full implementation. So usually what people do now, if you take a, a database course, probably in the first two lectures, you will learn the entity relationship model, and then you will learn how to translate it into SQL. Um, with data joint, you don't have to do that. You have one model that's both conceptually clarified and has an implementation that you can use for defining and querying data. 
So that's what, that's what you, will, uh, you will learn. So basically, a data, bit, uh, a data join pipeline looks like a graph. It's always direct, uh, acyclic, so you can organize it top down, so there are no loops. Um, so you go step by step, start, starting at the top, and go down. And, and the first um, nodes are for data entry, uh, and subsequent nodes are for computation. So you define the structure. So this is how you define the structure of a pipeline. You define it in Python or MATLAB and later in other languages by specifying these classes. For each node of the pipeline, you specify a class. And it has a definition that specifies the columns in the table, the attributes of the entities that each node represents, um, including dependencies between them. So these arrows here, like um, arrow from scan to session, then it shows up as a, in the diagram as a line. That basically means that um, a scan cannot exist without a, a session. So it's completely within a session. So this is how you, this is what you learn to do today, to basically define these tables, populate them, and uh, use them in a shared pipeline. So um, conceptually, we need to understand what each table must represent. Each table, um, and this is how you, you think of the design. If you, if, you come, if you think of a table as a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet can have any form. You can, you can use columns, rows, in any way. You can put multiple different types of things in the same table. In a, in a database, you need to separate that each entity, each type of thing is in its own table. And so these are kind of the, and, and this, is, this process of separating uh, information to multiple tables is called normalization, and this is what Usually it comes fairly intuitively, intuitively, but if it doesn't, these are the rules. Basically, each table can only contain one type of thing, um, so in, in its rows. The columns represent the attributes of those, of those things. The attributes must apply to every, to every entity. You cannot have like, so I can come up with a lot of counterexamples, but I'm sure they will come up in the, in the exercises. Um, and uh, each table must have an identifying attribute or several attributes, which are called the primary key, that basically helps identify each, each row, each entity. And uh, all entities must, must be able to participate in the same table that must be able to participate in the same types of dependencies or relationships with other entities. This is what you will learn to do today, to basically define these tables, populate them, and uh, use them in a shared pipeline. So um, conceptually, we need to understand what each table must represent. Each table, um, and this is how you, you think of the design. If you, if, you come, if you think of a table as a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet can have any form. You can use columns, rows, in any way. You can put multiple different types of things in the same table. In a, in a database, you need to separate that each entity, each type of thing is in its own table. And so these are kind of the, and, and this, is, this process of separating uh, information to multiple tables is called normalization, and this is what usually comes fairly intuitively, intuitively, but if it doesn't, these are the rules. Basically, each table can only contain one type of thing, um, so in, in its rows. The columns represent the attributes of those, of those things. The attributes must apply to every, to every entity. You cannot have like so I can come up with a lot of counterexamples, but I'm sure they will come up in the, in the exercises. Um, and uh, each table must have an identifying attribute or several attributes, which are called the primary key. That basically helps identify each, each row, each entity. And uh, all entities must, must be able to participate in the same table that must be able to participate in the same types of dependencies or relationships with other entities. So this conceptual refinement in data joint allows great simplification for, compared to SQL. If remember, SQL is the dominant language. That's what you will learn in, in, a, in a database course. So this is an example of what this buys us. This is an example of how you would define in a, in a design, for example, you, if you're designing a university database and you want to say a section of a cor course, a section belongs to this course. In SQL, this is roughly what it would look like. You would have to define, within the session table, you would have to define two attributes called department and course. 
specify their data types, comment them, then, then in for, and then specify a foreign key, saying that the department in course in this table refer to the department in course in the course table. In, uh, in data join, the same thing looks like this. You say uh, reference to course. And so even, even if people who use SQL who know SQL, after kind of understanding how the differences and how it's refined and kind of a bit more focused, the, working with data join becomes a lot smoother working with databases than with SQL. And I know SQL, but I, I use data join for all database interactions. So once you define it, once you define the structure of the database, it will enforce uh, integrity constraints. So for example, if you try to enter a session, and you try to enter a session um, that already uh, exists, it will reject it because it's not unique. If you try to add a session that, for which there is not a, a mouse, like for example, if you try to insert um, like the first row 93293, you try to insert it, it will work. If you try to insert it again, it will not work because it's already there. So the, it doesn't allow duplicates. It makes sure that you enter each entity once. If you're trying to insert, um, yeah, if you try to insert something twice, but if you try to insert a session for which there is, not a, there is no mouse, it will also reject it. So it maintains, it forces you to follow all the steps in the pipeline. Then um, uh, the next thing, is to how to query the data. So remember that queries are not just getting the same thing you put in. You want to extract the information in a different approach, in a, in, in a different form that's suitable to, to what you need right now. So rather than if you operate with files, to extract something, you need to get the whole file, parse the file, and get what you need. And if you need a little piece from many different files, then typically well, you'll need to download all the files, get that information. So you'll be writing a lot of download scripts, a lot of uh, parsing scripts, and then finally with, uh, comp well, compile the result that you need. With databases, you can just say, give me, the, give me something, and the database will, will go and extract it correctly. So all the operations are defined with these five operators. Restriction, which basically takes a table and only restricts it, only selects a part of the a subset of the rows in that table. Join, which joins two tables into one. Projection, which selects uh, a number of columns. Aggregation, uh, which computes, um, for one table, computes aggregated uh, quantities such as averages or sums from another table. And union, which basically takes two tables and combines them combines all their rows into the same table. Um, so here's an example of what that would look like. If you, in a typical design, if you ask the question, fi find all two photon scans on awake mice with the grading stimulus, like in our database, for example. In other, in non-relational uh, databases, you would have to write a script that basically a for loop that goes through, through all the folders, parses them, finds the information, handles the errors and then and gets the information. If you know SQL and if you use SQL, this will look looks something like this. And again, you need to take a database course to learn this. In data join, it looks it looks something like this. You say session restrict by anesthesia uh, is awake, so that's part of given that we want information from awake mice. Stimulus restricted to grading and then scan restricted by both of those things. So this is an example of the difference between how to write queries in SQL and how to write queries in data joint. Um, an additional advantage is that SQL is a separate language, so to call it from Python, you have to figure out how you need a language, you need to have an interface, an API, that sends the query and gets the result back. Data joint is, already, is implemented in each language, so this is what you would write directly in Python. Um, so data joint integrates computation, so optionally you can have computations in nodes. So if you write code that works with massive amounts of data, that continuously evolves as you build a data pipeline, you will often run into these types of problems. 
Um, so if, um, if you make an error in an entry and then you computed a bunch of things, so you make that correction, so you now you need to erase all the intermediate results and recompute them. Uh, and doing that well and systematically without errors is difficult. Um, you can change parameters of computations or have multiple versions or multiple multiple variations of parameters and you need to handle all that data. If you start dealing with terabytes of data, that becomes uh, unwieldy. So data joint implements a mechanism that you will learn that um, defines for a table such as alignment, for example, it defines a callback function that knows how, defines how to perform the computation for that node. And then every time that inform, any time information is missing, it will it will know how to recompute it and fill it back in. So the database, our data join database, data join pipeline, always knows what is not computed, what needs to be computed next. And you can just have any number of machines um, pulling it and, and computing any missing uh, computed information. And you can do this on converging, um, converging uh, pipeline patterns where you need to compute all combinations. So for example, if you do perform Segmentation, you have multiple segmentation methods. You can, um, it will perform each, all combinations of, for each scan, it will perform all the segmentation methods. So this is uh, something you will see today as well. So in Populate, if you, if you are a lab that uses data joint as its principal data organization tool, students learn how to write these um, uh, nodes in the, they learn, and it's a uniform way. So if, if I have a student who, is, or we have a student who is, um, who is defining new computation, I can examine their pipeline and I can immediately know what they computed, how. So it's a uniform way that the entire lab performs computations. And uh, finally, um, distributed computing becomes very natural because if you, uh, there's nothing else that you need, nothing that you need to, nothing special that you need to do to implement distributed computing, using multiple computers in the cloud or in the lab uh, to, to share the, the, the load. Once you specify what needs to be computed, data joint knows how to distribute it to multiple nodes. Um, architecture, so this is something that users do not need to know, but this is helpful to know. So underneath there is basically machinery that maintains and that enables the entire framework. Currently, it relies on the MySQL database for the structure and uh, non-relational storage uh, for just massive objects, such as images, movies. So you can insert in each table, you can insert large movies or very large objects, and, and, but they work within the relational framework. And as, uh, if you need to add additional services, such as uh, public interface or integration with a website or anything else, you can set up uh, additional infrastructure. So again, there's separation of labor. So if you are a scientist who works with data, you don't need to know this. You can ask someone to set it up and, and whoever sets it up does not need to know about your neuroscience. So you can, you can separate this. Whereas currently in a lot of labs, students have to figure out how to, to do a lot of things on the IT side as well. So this separation of labor is one of the key features. Um, and this, the architectures are currently very quickly evolving. So I don't know if you realize right now we're going through another database revolution. So there's been three basic big revolutions in, in databases. Um, one was just the, the origin of databases. Then the relational database revolution was started by basically by the relational model. And that was more about the data model. The data model drove the, the creation of new architectures. And the, the relational data model really dominated for a long time. And then um, early, uh, I guess in 2005, 2006, this whole NoSQL movement started. It's basically uh, a lot of people realized that the current architectures of the day did not meet some of their basic requirements. And now we have another explosion of a very different databases. So as, you, as new ones appear all the time, um, what you can do with data joint is, in the future, um, is keep the, the exact same model, the, same, the exact same code for interacting with the database, but change the backend to, to work with very different technologies. 
So I'll show a couple of examples, just very quick illustrations. What a real pipeline, so this is a real pipeline that's used for integrating two photon imaging and uh, a segmented electron microscopy uh, data sets. Um, so it does get more complex. What you saw in the beginning was just a very simple, simplified example. So database, these, and if you took, take a look at a pipeline for a more complex project, it gets quite, quite involved. But what it allows us to do is split up the work. I can, once you see this pipeline, you immediately know its structure. You can, you can look at each node, see what information is stored, how it's computed, and so that really helps communicate between, within large teams. Another example, um, this is actually, I should post the link as well, this is also in the public domain, is the, um, the program to generate stimuli for our mice. So it's also a database, but also an application that you can run and ju just generates and stores um, stimuli for, uh, to present to mice, so you can analyze visual processing. And then downstream from the, from the stimulus pipeline, you have the analysis pipeline, which computes receptive fields. And so the, you can start building up, starting with how to run an experiment, running the experiment, and then processing, and then analysis, all the way to the final figure in your paper. And so just to show the scale, this is actually from a couple of years ago. From each mouse, we collect thousands, and now tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of receptive fields. Um, DataJoint.io is the, the go-to site for, um, for all the information. Um, we are working to expand the documentation. This is something that needs a lot of work still, but it's a good start. So I think the general, um, from a workshop, uh, uh, workshops are good for familiarizing yourself with the topic, but really to get into it, you need to start doing something, doing a project and learning, learning the, the steps. So, so I, this is kind of to, um, to set the expectations. After a two-day workshop, you'll get the basic ideas, but not necessarily become fully proficient. Um, so I'll, um, I'd like to thank the people who have contributed over the years. So DataJoin has been around for about nine years now. So people, uh, again, it started in Andreas Tolle's lab. Um, one thing that is very important about the lab that data was always, has always been valued as central and important. And we can go back 10 years and, and see what was done and redo the analysis. So, so with that kind of focus, then it's easy to, to implement tools because there's demand for them. And so a lot of labs don't have that culture, and, but, but, there, but now that there is that tendency um, and push to, to change that culture. Um, so a lot of people um, were, some labs were early adopters um, in like around 2010, like uh, Thanos Siapas or um, Laura Busi adopted, uh, and that helped a lot to basically see how, how it worked, works in other labs. And of course, I'd like to thank Neuronex. Any questions? All right, so hopefully that was enough to give you an overview. Maybe, hopefully it was actually enough to almost overwhelm you. Uh, so if you at this point feel like, okay, I totally understand what data joint is all about, I got every point of it, you're more than welcome to leave. For the rest of us who would like to really dive into and get a hands-on experience, this is the right place to stay.